Okay. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to episode 34 of Cutting for Sign. We're doing a little different to, differently today. Uh, we're going to start out with just Daniel and I and what we're going to dub um, target practice. I know it's kind of a hunting theme. <laughs> a little on the nose. A little on the nose. Is it too much on the nose? It's probably too I came up with it. My stuff always too on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to I'll come idea. up with the with the rough draft and then Ron, you can smooth out the edges to make make it cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, target practice is okay for now. We'll call it that. Um, oh, so what it is is it, it, you and I are gonna just talk before our guest comes on. And today's guest is a little interesting because um I've always loved and respected all of our previous guests, but this guy's uh, different in the sense that he was an actual legitimate hero of mine in my early 20s. And I'm a little nervous. Uh, Goldie's excited. You can hear her chasing a ball behind me. Um, so we're all excited. The whole household is excited. Um, Goldie, please. Thank you so much. Okay. His name is Timmy O'Neill. He's a professional rock climber. I'm not going to do a whole introduction thing, but I... Daniel, what do you think of me kind of, you've seen me off camera and off, off mic, all that stuff, like get a little bit nervous and, and excited about this. Are you yeah. watch, Are you ready to watch me just have a complete train wreck of like <laughs> watching hoping, my hero? I'm hoping that happens, but I think you're going to pull it together. And I'm already disappointed that that's going to happen. That is going to pull it together. Yeah. I, I have a few tricks to hopefully derail you a little bit, but I have to derail you, but not derail Timmy. So it's, hmm. I took about an hour scheming last night and figured some moves out. And I, I think that, I think you're going to fuck this up. Oh, good. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Uh, speaking of fucking it up, I just got a text message from my online doctor about my ADHD medicine. So we'll see how that goes too. I'm on day three of um, Adderall, I guess it is. Um, so People maybe attention during I don't know what she said, <laughs> <laughs> but this is my first time ever being on a stimulant ever. I, I mean, any kind other than caffeine and I feel okay. I don't feel like, Bleh. But I heard there's some secret powers with these drugs. So we'll see if something great happens to me. Interesting. You got a lot of moving parts these days. You got a new car. Well, I've, I put a deposit down for new car. It's coming in a couple of weeks. Really? Couple yeah. Weeks. Takes oh. a couple of weeks. T turns out the whole car market is like weeks and months behind on inventory. Yeah. No, that's true because of those chips. Yeah. You because know, of the micro, micro. Yeah, there's something going on in the chip world that's screwing up a lot of. Anyways, I think Timmy you're O'Neil. actually. I think I you're you. actually describing one of the subplots to the movie The Departed. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, all right. So yeah. Timmy O'Neill's coming on, and you're feeling nervous about it, which is awesome. That's really cool that you. Uh, what What's the um? I don't know. What, what's a way that he affected your life in in, in like, in some way. Oh, I, I mean, nervous? yeah. So, I mean, you're not good at what you do, so I get why you're nervous. I was insecure. <laughs> <laughs> that was a delayed laugh because I'm trying not to like laugh out my nose. <laughs> oh, that would have been the best. Uh, um, Is there a name for those when you make somebody chortle? It's a chortle. Chortle. Oh. Yeah, it's like you know that <laughs> that kind of like no when you're drinking something and then you oh. some of you laugh and you spit it everywhere. Oh, uh, I don't know that. That should yeah. definitely be a thing. Okay, we're gonna figure that out before Timmy gets on. We're gonna try to do it to him while he's drinking something during the interview. All right, what do you think? Uh, oh, okay, so uh, Timmy is to say he's a professional rock climber is is kind of an understatement. He's been a professional rock climber for for probably twenty ish years you know, around there and anything in my life, any, any uh, large goal towards climbing was influenced by the stuff he did when I was young. Uh, definitely seeing him and his partners, Dean Potter, who's passed away about five years ago, um, speed climbing walls in Yosemite, especially was super influential so much so that, that, that goal that idea, that dream, like didn't leave me for years and years and years and years. And I finally had to go do it, do one of those walls um, in 2019. And that is because of Timmy. I mean, it's, I wouldn't say like Timmy talked me into it, but he was the guy, he was the guy 20 years ago doing that kind of thing, making it possible before the speed ascents. It wasn't, uh, wasn't really in vogue. It was just like, you'd go climb a big wall 
and a big wall would take you three or four days, five days, sometimes more. What's the definition of this? Of, because I know you climbed El Cap. No, in Half Dome. Half Dome. You climbed Half Dome in 19 hours. Yeah. But what makes that a speed climb version? Generally, it, it's done in three days. And so like anything under any kind of in one day? In, anything under a day. <clears throat> yeah. So if they say in a day, that's generally considered speed climbing for grade four, five, and six walls. What I, and, and, the, and the grades mean like how many days it takes. So, so his record of climbing three grade six walls in 24 hours is that's in, fucking bonkers it's insanity because not only did he climb those walls he hiked the mileage between those things right like it takes oh, you know right. you're i think half dome alone is somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 miles of hiking all in <laughs> oh, okay. yeah 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 um and that's um and and with four thousand feet of elevation gain that's does not include the wall itself uh so his 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 athletics athleticism is is you know they were doing would, they were doing David Goggins shit way before. <laughs> <laughs> I would you think know. too, like with Tim, from what I understand of him, that who he is and who he has become as a person would probably have a lot to do with why you'd be nervous because he seems like a singular personality and with heart and intelligence and ability and then social acumen you know he's a lot, a lot of boxes are being a lot of things are coming together he's sound, almost like he's like an outlier you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah what do you think that outlier means what do you mean by that i know i know you've read the book like give me that little example of that mm, i haven't articulated what i think it really means but i would say when several kind of unique circumstances they would be pretty unique on their own but several of them get put together into one person or situation or life to create something that is just very rare yeah 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 you know he's, I mean? a, he's a super rare breed i mean that's yeah. his his um he's still climbing he's still doing badass shit and he's been with um you know some of the top rock climbing brands in the world for a long long time and it's still stayed in that world and that's that's not super common not common at all <laughs> in an uncommon sport he's an uncommon guy well yeah just like you have sense of humor that gets combined with like world-class physical ability yeah it gets combined with Oh, I've been doing the thing that I love since I was, you know, or before my twenties, you know, combined with, uh, I can speak to people and yeah. like connect yeah. combined with, I care about things, <laughs> you know, yeah. you know, it's just like, there's a lot going on there. And anyone who would have one or two of those would probably be having a pretty amazing life. You know, I don't know why I think this, but I think he's also done a few minutes of stand up. No, he has. He, uh, one of his bios, he's described as a stand up comedian. Is that right? That's fucking awesome. I almost put it in the intro, but I was like, mm, I, 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 I don't know. I wasn't quite sure. But some of his other stuff is considered kind of like he wrote a comedy. He wrote a yeah. comedy. Yeah. Yeah. He also beatboxes. We should <laughs> probably get him. We should really? probably get him to beatbox. Yeah. He uh I saw in one of the, in the trailer of one of the things, he's a drummer too. He drums. He was crushing this set. <laughs> it was good. It's That's interesting. amazing. You know, I Anyways, blah, blah, blah. No, what are you going to say? Say it. say it. I just, I appreciate, I val really value uh, interactions and people, interactions with people who like trust themselves to, um, to kind of touch you and, and jostle you and mm. surprise you. Mm. And my first, very first voice, real time, real life interaction with Tim was like, which we'll, uh, we'll probably just chat about briefly. It was just, he was kind of, he called me like cold, not cold call me, but he called me knowing that I wouldn't have his number. You know? <laughs> and he was following up after a very long, you know, not a long time, but yeah. like he was following up after I thought that we were not going to do this. And he kind of gave me a little shit, never met me, doesn't know me. And he like very appropriately kind of pulled one over on me. And I just, I love when people have the confidence and the sense of humor and the ability to, uh, to just kind of, make a little joke with someone yeah. who they don't know, you know, because yeah. I think people are a lot more available to be surprised in a pleasant way than people think. I think a lot of times we're afraid that if it's a stranger, we don't want to be rude, but it's like, I don't know. I think people are more available for that than, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Surprised and delighted. We want to be surprised and delighted. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, I, heard, was... I, 
I heard that I as was, a definition of art one time. Between, oh, really? Yeah, it's something that surprises and delights. But anyway, well, sorry, if, go ahead. if that's art, then I'm a fucking artist. Let me give you an example. <laughs> I don't know you why you think you're surprising or delightful, but <laughs> delusional. Well, <laughs> I was cru- I was cruising on one of those rental scooters yesterday with my daughter, and which is like you know questionable but awesome. And we were cruising through downtown Portland, and this guy walks in front of me, like directly in the in my path. Oof and oblivious to me coming and so i just they, those little scooters have like a, a really charming sounding little like bike bell it's, like, ding, ding. it's oh, so pretty nice. it's like ding ding and he like slowly turns around and then he sees me like kind of coming in at speed with my daughter on there too and he like kind of steps out of the way and he gets really big and i was just like the perils of modern life man and you know and it was great that, that that fell flat how was that, that was connected so to anything we were know. just talking about because it was a surprise and delight <laughs> to that guy Oh, it was. Yeah. See, the way you told the story, it sounded like he was like, "What?" The f-? You know, no, he got no, really he, big. He turned around. I thought it was amazing. He was like, "Oh, oh that's look cool. how cute yeah. that totally. is." Totally. There you go. Yeah. yeah. It's a charm. You see, it's a little sketchy to throw your daughter, you know, on, on the back of a thing. You're not a good driver. We all know this. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ronald's an excellent driver. Like I'm excellent. Above average. Yeah. Oh. Even though the one time you drove my car, you returned it and it was broken and and like wired in a different way. So oh, I just uh... like disconnected everything <laughs> that wasn't useful to me, like traction control. <laughs> <laughs> those nanny uh, devices well anyways yeah yeah so i liked it i was surprised and i was delighted and uh that was my first interaction so i was like what a, what an interesting person are you person. are you um like confused by me wanting to have this guy on here like this is uh, yeah i mean is it weird just to have like a you're not you're you're not from the climbing world or the mountaineering world or or that kind of world and so is it weird to kind of like step into this circle and well pump the brakes man i've climbed i've climbed i've climbed a 19,000 foot mountain oh shit that's no joke that's several giant. 16 and 15s wow. and i've ice climbed and i Whoa. almost died on a mountain and i hiked the john muir trail in nine days which is 200 220 miles yeah i was yeah. in it for a little while yeah yeah that's legit that's legit ice climbing is uh uh terrifying i've never done it totally agree that was in alaska and it was about a 34 a 30 foot what you call it a pitch yeah it was yeah. like 30 feet and i remember right at the top i like clunked my ice axe in and i was like if i fall right now i'm gonna not die but i'm gonna be fucked up yeah <laughs> and i might die i'm probably exaggerating by like 10 feet so let's call it 20 it was like 20 yeah. feet but like, okay you know, Yourself. were you roped up i don't think so but probably okay because <laughs> i wouldn't i i, I think well, we were yeah were you on drugs <laughs> <laughs> I, i've never caught also who are you <laughs> it's really Did nice you to see this you, on youtube Is that you... <laughs> i'm just really when it comes to exploits like that i really try not to exaggerate you know like there's time for exaggeration but like if i'm really thinking about it, we probably were roped up yeah um, but i remember being really scared and legitimately so and i was an idiot back then i was early 20s you know doing yeah. really dumb things man like what what was the dumbest thing you did well okay it's a climbing story actually yeah okay oh i like I, this Let's i was this with going. this little guy named zach he's a really badass climber and we were climbing up this little mountain in alaska called jewel mountain on thanksgiving day and it got, and we got late to the cabin and it's only about a 3000 foot climb. And we wanted to do a sunset climb. So we climb up at sunset and it gets socked in while we're up there. Mm. And Zach, he was really the dumb one. And he's a really experienced climber, but he's kind of, he was kind of bold. Mm. And he decided to take us down a different route than we had come up. And oh. it was really dumb because we couldn't see. Yeah. We didn't know what we were going down. And we basically just climbed down. And as we climbed down, it got steeper and steeper and steeper. And it got more and more socked in and it got darker and darker. And those three things eventually pinned us to a point where, and this is not an exaggeration. We yeah. had to, we were at a place where we could not go down any further because it was too steep. Yeah. And we couldn't go back up because it was too dark and sketchy. Like we just, could, we were pinned. And Zach literally had to jump off of a, a ledge the into fog and he jumped and disappeared what? i'm not we were we were we thought we were gonna die i mean this was intense 
he disappeared. And then I just hear his voice yell. And it turns out we were right at the bottom, about yeah. seven or eight feet down. I yeah. jump in. We're good. The next morning we look back and it's exactly like we had climbed almost all the way down and just to the last little moment. And we, oh, we just, we got so fucking lucky, man. Dude. All right. That's legit. That's uh that's a, that's a, that's a big one. Yeah. I always thought I was yeah. going to die. Uh, I thank you. Thank you for the question. I know it's 10 o'clock now and we got to get him on. Um, but no, I don't feel weird about it at all. I think that you admire him and for good reason. Awesome. So he'll be joining us any minute here. I mean, how, I think it's, I would say as good a guest as you can possibly have, you know, someone yeah. who's interesting to talk to as heart. He's down to talk about his like inner world and, uh, he's done some interesting things and he's, he's thriving, you know? Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. Let's see. Um, is that it? Are we good, Ron? What's I think wrong? we're ready. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Tim, I'm Ron Cecil. Good to meet you. Thanks for coming on this podcast. Hell yeah, Ron. Cool. Very cool. All right, Dan. Timmy O'Neill, you are a professional rock climber, first ascensionist, and public speaker. You have dedicated your time to a life of international exploration and giving back through Adventure Impact, the combination of outdoor adventure and social impact. You have climbed without ropes, buildings such as the, the Chicago Tribune Tower. And in 2001, along with Dean Potter, you set the then world speed record for the nose climb on El Capitan, completing it in three hours and 24 minutes. You led a four-day ascent of El Cap with Warren McDonald, a double above the knee leg amputee and our co-founder of Paradox Sports, a nonprofit that integrates individuals with disabilities into outdoor recreation. You also volunteer as an ophthalmic tech on the African continent to help pure, uh, cure preventable blindness with cureblindness.org. More recently, you founded Joy Merchants, which offers outdoor retreats with the intention of strengthening personal relationships via curated individual exercises and both trail and fireside conversation. You also produced the award-winning films Urban 8 and Return to Sender and co-wrote the nonfiction comedy Across the Atlas. You believe everybody is radi radiating love and promise and have been described by your contemporaries as intelligent, kind, and fiercely passionate about the well-being of others. Welcome, Timmy O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Ron. And, and after that uh, introduction, I think we've said enough. Thank you and good night. <laughs> good night. Good night, everybody. Appreciate it coming. It has been such yeah. a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to say right off the bat, um, uh, something I really appreciate about people is, and especially, I guess, not to put too fine of a point on like gender, but especially about men and men meeting each other for, you know, is when people can express their needs and their emotional state. And uh, I really appreciate right off the bat, you like coming in today and letting us know how you were doing and, and that you're, you know, you're expressing a little tired, you've been traveling a lot. And it just like helps us meet you where you're at and i just think that's huge for for the world right now does that make sense i hope that's not strange to say no no not at all and i think for the listener just before we started this call everybody to say hello I, I let these guys know that their energy level which is amazing is maybe a little higher than mine because I, i've been traveling and but i'd said that i feel fragile right now i feel mm -hmm. like you know just a little worn down and a little more exposed and maybe mm -hmm. not as poised or composed so yeah, and I wanted to let you guys know that so you could give me a little leeway or a little space, basically. Yeah, yeah. interestingly enough, it gives us a lot of space because it's just something that uh, Ron and I, as good friends, you know, we're all about that. You know, it's it just makes things so much easier uh, to be able to express oneself <laughs> in one's like place, inner inner space. You know. So so I have, if I could just start with the first question too, if you know, you guys got in touch with me and you reached yeah. out and said, hey, we, we found you and, and we want to talk with you and we want to explore your story. And why? 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 Because there are many podcasts out there. You know that and there are many yeah. people sharing stories and exploring and, and mining others for their personal wisdom. If you could just tell me about your podcast and, and tell me, um, I did read about it and we did have a preliminary talk, but yeah. what's our point today, you know, in this conversation and what's the hope of the podcast? I mean, I think both me and Ron can take a stab at answering it, but for, for me, and it's pretty similar between Ron and I, uh, the ethos and our goal and our intention, it's also, but it changes with each guest, like Ronald has a different, he, he's coming to you from a different place, um, but for me, you know, <clears throat> basically to get people in here who have 
achieved something or are, uh, and by something, I don't mean just outwardly, like an inner sense of balance and thriving, or maybe they've gotten over some difficult challenges um, and are to some extent thriving inwardly and outwardly. But then it's kind of developed into, and, and the cutting for sign means like the little like signs in life that have led you along your trail. What do those look like? That was kind of the beginning of it all, but it's turned into more like we're really into particularly um, helping, I want to say men, but it's really just the masculine in the world, regardless of what body it's in, just like express itself, feel good, feel comfortable, feel confident um, with being vulnerable or being honest or being emotional. And uh, it's something around that has been, we've noticed has been really valuable, you know, which is Ron and I were talking right before this about you. And, you know, we were, I was asking Ronald, like what, what it was about you that you know changed his life so much and it was not only your accomplishments outwardly but it's like who you were in these other aspects of life was my observation but he can speak for himself on that yeah hey man um i started climbing in 1997 and and was never good i was never a good climber i i was uh uh, afraid and weak <laughs> and even when I got strong I was never as strong as I wanted to be and never as brave as I wanted to be and and yet I was in the periphery of the climbing world um you know for the better part of the last 20 years right and <clears throat> I think my first um exposure to you was in Return to Cinder a film you produced uh in the early 2000s I believe is that right early 2000s yeah mm -hmm. yeah and um and that became a moment for me where I remember watching you I think you were beatboxing and yeah. mining, uh yeah climbing a crack <laughs> and I was so delighted by it that I made my then uh uh girl I was with then like watch it and she, she just wasn't a climber or anything and, and I made her like watch it a few times I'm like please you have to watch how funny this is and how <laughs> great this was and that was the first time I was exposed to you and I and I was um enthralled by your humor around this world because it's I don't know. I mean, like I, I've never been fully in the lifestyle in the sense that I've never like quit my job and, and done all those things that a lot of people aspire to do in a lifestyle sport. Um, but you were on my radar, man. And then especially when you guys started speed climbing in the early 2000s and setting up, you know, insane records, you seem to be the guy that was in the very least having the most fun. And, and I know there was a lot of, uh, or I, I assume there was a lot of um tension and and like some kind of um uh i don't know drive right like you like it, there's a, a sense of competition and and i know in those early days there was a few people vying for those speed records and and for the, those who are not in the climbing world there's most people who listen to us yosemite valley has you know several large walls that in the past took days to climb and Timmy and his partners were climbing these things, not only in hours, but linking them up, uh, sometimes three of them at a time under 24 hours, which is an insane human feat. Uh, and again, I just thought you always seemed to be the guy who looked like he was having the most fun. And Daniel was asking me, he's like, why, you know, what, what was one of your kind of big values that you've taken away from Timmy in your life? And, and you know, I, I climbed pretty um, regularly until about, the year 2010 when I moved to Portland and then I became a dad. Um, I started a family. I was running a, a million dollar business here in the Portland area and, um, uh, you know, got fat and happy and, you know, stopped cl climbing. And then a climbing gym across the street opened up literally from where I live. Um, and I thought, okay, well, like, I guess the universe is giving me the signal that I don't get to quit. So I, joined and started climbing again and a few more years go by actually a bunch of years more go by and uh, I was coming back from a work conference and that conference was about you know really living the life you want to have and allowing your job or your work to um, finance the lifestyle that you want to you know the dreams come first the work comes second is kind of the point of it and I was just thinking about lifelong dreams that I had always had and never had had completed. And one of those was to climb a wall in 24 hours. And, and so I remember coming back, I think that, that was in Phoenix and I was coming back on a night flight. And I, for some reason, just wrote half dome at the top. 
and um, and within a year, you know, got to go climb it in you know 19 hours, which is not fast at all compared to what people are doing, especially even casually now. But for me, it was a really, really, really big deal. It was like one of those moments where I had to almost like the hero's journey where you can't kind of move on from some parts of your life until certain things are complete. And for me internally, Tim, that like, um, that ticked a lot of boxes for me. That ticked a tremendous amount of stuff for me. And um, in some ways I still haven't recovered. My toenails have still not recovered from that, <laughs> that, that, that thing. I also ran a marathon later that year. So I thought that you know, all the running didn't help either. But um, anyway, man, that's, that, that's what it came for. For me is, is not, not just your prowess on uh, climbing or, or athleticism, but you've always had this joie de vivre. You've always had this sense of humor and a sense of joy. I love that you, um, uh, what's the name of the company that you're taking people outdoors again? Daniel joy Merchant. Joy Merchant, man. I think that's one of the best names ever. I just thought, holy shit, that's incredible. So that for me, Timmy, is why I wanted to talk to you because a lot of people who listen to this aren't in lifestyle sports or they do, but they dabble. And, and you were brave enough to fully step in in a time when it was questionable whether anyone could ever make a living doing this kind of thing. And you've had, I'm sure you've had your, I know you have had had your share of sorrows and setbacks and things like that, that in this world. And yet you have always been this person that's been a shining light. And I think men in particular um, will work hard on completing goals and do so in a way that actually cuts themselves off from their joy and cuts themselves off from uh, being lit up about life and, and cuts themselves off from their bliss. And you are a person who, at least outwardly, and at least through the channels that I've seen you, you've, you've never been disconnected from that, or at least have uh, made it, uh, you know, shown us a way that looks like you are following your bliss loving yourself deeply and also like really, truly helping people. And that's, what's fascinating to me. I mean, I, I mean, I could talk to you and get nerdy about all the climbing stuff and we could go talk about mountain ranges and routes and all that stuff. And that's not really what I'm most pumped about. What I'm most pumped about is you've decided to be a help to mankind and you're a funny dude and you are a joyful guy. And I'm not going to put you on the spot and say like, say something funny to me. Um, just kidding. <laughs> uh, but that's why, man, I mean, like, you know, you know, so like take any pressure off to like talk about some a crazy project you're doing or or a film project you're working on or anything like that. And I want to talk about like, who's Timmy on the inside? What's your emotional, spiritual uh, well-being like? Like, what do you do to keep that joy going? Where's your source come from? Who inv who, who excites you in that world? Uh, who's feeding you? What's feeding you right now? And and like it's obvious that you want to spread that around. And so, how are you doing that? Well, that's so many questions. So <laughs> we could go go back to the beginning of yeah. this. And there's um, a great quote by uh, Alex Lowe, which is the best climber is the one having the most fun, mm. right? And it's actually not about grades. It's not yeah. about you know how courageous you are and how difficult the climb is and I think really it's about how much fun you're having in this environment, in this place, you know, with these people that you're with and, yeah. and for this shared purpose. And a lot of times the shared purpose goes way beyond the, the summit, right? And the summit is this solitary little point. And it's just one small part of that journey all the way up and all the way back. Mm. And just um, a couple of days ago, I climbed this thing called the Incredible Hulk on the east side of the Sierra. Yeah. And it's one of my favorite rocks ever. It's so beautiful. It's a thousand feet tall. It's an unbelievable piece of granite that's so fractured and perfect for, for the viewer or for the, anybody that can see it or experience it. But I was with this new friend of mine um, named Lore Saberin, who just became a new Patagonia Alpine athlete. Mm. And Lore has this new film that Patagonia has produced called They Them, as Lore experiences a non-binary wow. you know, gender specific yeah. life. And so it's this story of them having this transformation as a climber yeah. and transformation as a human. That's awesome. And a transformation as uh, somebody who's being vocal 
around oh. the ability for an individual to identify and and define themselves and not as a point of of defiance or difference but one of like unifying or right mm -hmm. one of understanding and so the point I bring that up is because we have this incredible experience hiking in for five miles, doing this amazing climb, descending and hiking back out. And all the while, it's actually this vehicle for conversation. Yeah. It's actually this vehicle for uh, communication and like a deep dive and the ability to lean in and ask questions, much like this podcast, yeah. right? So climbing for me has always been about being together with interesting people with unusual purpose in beautiful places. Mm. And, and because I early on in my climbing career really identified humor as another way to reach people and not only relieve the stress, you know, we call it gallows humor in climbing where you joke about what could happen and death and destruction and uh, um, to relieve the stress, but you also have humor just as a way to connect and to relate and to look at the lighter, easier side of life. Um, mm. And I think humor has a great way of, of being connective tissue around positivity. Um, and it's memorable, right? You know, that great Maya Angela quote, people will forget what you said, what you did, yeah. et cetera, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. Yeah. Right? So, so, yeah. so much of life for me is about feeling, right? About meaning. And my personal story with climbing and that gnarly thing I did on that gnarly route, like really who cares? That's so egocentric and inward. I'm looking um, outward so much, especially older now at being 52 mm -hmm. and being an older climber and an older person and trying to find those ways to, again, to connect and then to personally age um, and accept and to be more graceful um, in life. You know, Ron, Ron, Ron and, I, and I were talking a little bit before this, uh, before you came on, and um, you were talking about humor and particularly how people uh, make each other feel and that being more memorable and ergo, I would say more meaningful, um, you know, uh, to surprise and to delight is something that I think is a capacity we all have at all times. And there's sundry ways we can do that and do that in uh, with other people and touch other people whether it's like ronald and i talk about complimenting people and we try to be very free with our compliments and, and spontaneous and creative like if we have if we notice something in the world about a person that we that brings us surprise and delight then we can voice that and share it and so when we hang out we kind of challenge each other to do that and i'm talking the all genders all ages you know and um, it's, it's a, it's a total joy to do that. And the first interaction I had with you, you did that to me and as really memorable and really meaningful. And it was very small and it took probably zero effort on, on your part. But when you called me and you were following up, uh, you know, a few months after I had called you cause you've been busy, I felt like you kind of like, you came in with a lot of energy, probably knowing that I wouldn't know who was on the phone, and I was giving myself some shit later talking to Ronald about it because I was like, I didn't rise to the occasion. Like, you <laughs> caught me off my guard. And I was like, damn, man, like he was showing some humor. And you know, just by the way you were saying hi, no one I wouldn't know. Who, and I'm right, just like, right. it, it reminded me like, God, you got to be more game, man. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Me. Yeah, I, I was, I was, I was punking you just a little bit. On I loved call. it. And I was like, dang, I got punked. <laughs> well, which is one thing about that is I, I still leave voicemails, right? Cause I'm older, I right? Voicemail it, yeah. is dead. Right. You know, so, but I still do it like old school and I try awesome. and leave because somebody is listening to it and people yeah. resent, like, don't even leave a voicemail. I'm deleting it, you know, <laughs> on their message. Text me only. So I'll try and leave Scrooge. really good voicemail to, to uh, make it worth their listen right dude 100%. you guys you guys should just call 100%. each other all the time because this mo daniel leaves me fucking five minute long voice messages <laughs> all the time <laughs> maybe not five and i have no no definitely five minutes so i have to like get into a space where i can like listen and be, be in there but every time i listen like oh that's awesome so bring totally back the voice, agree timmy voice that's mail. awesome i'm glad you put some some like conversation articulation around that you know and uh, voicemail mails like huge value of mine too. <laughs>
That's great. What's been keeping you busy these days? You were you were just in Scotland, the furthest far reaches of Scotland. Do you have a good time up there? I did, yeah. And I guess what's keeping me busy first and foremost, Ron, is breathing. And that's sort of autonomic, so I don't really have a choice. It's, I'm going to be breathing. Um, secondly would be drinking. You know, I guess I'd say yeah. the physiologic needs uh, would, would be like what's keeping me the most busy. And eating, some, some, some I would sleeping. say sleeping. <laughs> top three, yeah, top four, okay. okay yeah, top good. four. And then shelter, you know, like yeah. having a home. Uh, so those are my top five right now. Like that kind of Thank you for giving hierarchy. Ron shit on that question because yeah. he knows, Ron Sunday knows shitty, that's one like of my grounders. It's like, <laughs> like the Vegas question. So what's been happening lately? Uh, so right in that next thing we get like, so what have you been reading? So, uh, so anyway, what'd you have for breakfast? Today? What are you drinking? What's in that cup right there? So or just what's up? Is there what's anything up? in that cup? So what's up? Hey man, looking good. All right. So enough about me. What Tell me you about your hair about products. Me? Like what Ron, are you, what are you Ron told me before this podcast started that he was going to ask some really <laughs> shitty questions just to get my goat a little bit. And I think that I just watched him do it. You're just to do like zero, right. you're kind just of like a zero prep. Like, yeah, so um, I've done nothing for this interview at all, but uh, who, Timmy O'Neill. Um, um, where is who? Timmy oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, I have been busy. I've been, um, but that being said, you know, I, I say that I'm self underemployed, right? I mean, I'm purposefully trying to have uh, as much free time as possible, right? They say time is money. So I'm an oligarch, right? I try and have as much of my time to myself as I can. And that's not to say that I'm not working a ton. All yeah. Time. I feel like doing all this volunteer stuff, but yeah, I've been busy, man. It's been- it kind of r- reminds me of something that I j- was watching the trailer to one of the, I think it's the movie about, oh, I can't remember. But anyways, it's one of the trailers, you know, and they were asking you, uh, I think they asked something to the effect of what do you think about when you think about love? Mm-hmm. And oh, yeah, first right. thing you said was Amanda, which I believe, yeah. is that your partner or is or was? Former, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you said like your partner was. And then the second thing you said was yourself. And I was like, really glad to hear that because that can be misconstrued, obviously, as being selfish. But it's really that like, it's a pretty common metaphor, right? When they talk about the, you're on the airplane and you got to put the mask on yourself first. Mm -hmm. But I really feel like that, like filling up one's teacup so it can overflow is like really important. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that you Mm -hmm. spoke to that. And I think that being generous with one's with oneself regarding creating time, you know, and some of the other things you're talking about. It's a huge value of mine. And I know Ronald's too. Well, I was just talking with a friend about, you know, they, they asked me the question. They're like, well, how do you justify taking so much of your time to be away from, I'm married, my wife is Sarah, right? Mm-hmm. Like to be gone from Sarah, you know, or to, or to be gone in the back country. And, and I love being outside. Like I love going to the Incredible Hulk and to Yosemite and just climbing sea stacks in Scotland and, you know, having this deep dive into wilderness and wildness, it just charges me so much. So anyway, they're like, how do you justify um, doing that? I'm like, well, look, I I need that. Like, I I can't be whole. and I can't have a good basis and and a good foundation because so much of my other work is reaching out to help other people. And when you reach out, right, suddenly you have to have that good foundation because if you don't, you're going to topple, right? So you know, the whole point of a lever is you have this fulcrum, right? So if I'm the fulcrum, I'm this fixed point mm. that the weight gets pulled up with, right? So when I'm working with other people and I'm doing my mentorship and I'm doing my deep dives around adaptive climbing and working with these new athletes and high level athletes and all of the work that I do that's around community and, uh, and assisting others, right? I need to make sure I'm good. And yeah. where, where I get that the best is um, in the back country and being mm. away. So if I'm taking care of myself, and I say this all the time, I'm actually number one. Yeah. I'm the most important thing in my life because it's all here. It's, it's all being housed in this vessel, right? Whether it's the mind, the body, uh, the combination of those, which would be the spirit, perhaps. Um, I got to take care of me. Where are some why, areas? Jokingly, I said, you know, breathing is number <laughs> yeah. one, and drinking and eating. So, sorry, God, you were saying. Dave. I was just curious where some areas are, if you don't mind sharing, that maybe it's more challenging to give to yourself. I mean, I'd say the more more. Well, I would say I want to write a book, right? Mm. Like I've been really 
dying to write a book. So holding myself accountable to that, like I've tried twice now to write mm. a book. And both times I got a large body of workout. And then, you know, both times were about a three month process before I shelved it again, right? So I would say caregiving for myself in a way that, that holds me accountable to a better work ethic around achieving that goal. That's the number one thing I could think of immediately. That's what came up right away mm. was, it's, you know, holding myself accountable to doing a, an audacious project, which I would yeah. love to release. Like I'd say like, I'd be more remiss in not writing a book than I would in, in having a child. Right. You yeah. Know, like, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to step in here, Daniel, please. Yeah. It's my time to shine. Um, I'm really glad we're talking about self-love and you being number one, because in, in, uh, April, February, thank you. February of, uh, 2020, I, um, I'm kind of religious. I'm like religious ish. I, I have rituals and, and things in my life that I follow. And, and, uh, and one of those things was preparing for Lent, the Lent season leading up to Easter. And I, um, my background is I, I went to school to be a Christian minister and never could fully buy into all of the dogma that would a, a pastor would, would need to believe in, in order to, to do this job. And I, and, you know, a fair amount of it, I couldn't, I just couldn't do it, but there's, there's some of it that I've retained. And one of those things that I've retained is this idea that there is some f- mysterious force out there that leans back when we lean into it. And I don't know what that is. It could be anything. It could just be biology and that's fine with me. Uh, but I, as I was preparing for that season and thinking about the, the 40 days of reflection that I was going to put myself into and wondering what that might look like, something popped into my head. And that was, if I actually believe in any kind of love that exists out there, that's outside of myself, if I really believe in that, if I really expect it to participate with me in any way, whether it's just my friendship, which is an amazing friendship with Daniel, or getting to have these great conversations with people like you, Timmy, if I don't love myself first, then I don't really believe in that kind of love. If I don't actually love myself in a way that care, that takes care of myself and loves the immature parts of me, the juvenile parts of me, the fearful parts of me, the uh, afraid parts of me, then it's really, I'm just lying. I'm pretending that I, that I believe in love and not living that way. And, and I, at the time I thought, well, what's, what's something I can do to signal to myself and my nervous system that I am going to love myself on a daily basis. And one of those things that came up to the top was writing every single day. And, and that first year I wrote, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 chapters of a book that I, that didn't know existed until it started coming out. And since then, Daniel and I've gotten to work on it. We were in a writer's group together and we've got some projects rolling. So I, I I fully get that, man. And I, and I wonder now, like, what's your next step for that self-love and that kind of love for yourself? Are you going to hole up in, in your space? Are you going to go to a writer's conference? Are you going to join a writer's group? What are you doing? Well, I have a a really amazing mentor in this book writing project, a friend of mine named Jib. And I was, um, I'm working with Jib and, and I was thinking about how I can, he's helped me those two other times, right? And I failed, which is fine, right? Failure helps you understand how- What do you mean by failure? You just didn't complete it? Is that what you mean? Well, I was going to say is that failure is just data, right? It helps you Mm -hmm. course correct, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and and a failure is fine, right? I mean, if you don't fail, you're probably not going to succeed, right? Um, But regardless, I was going to get a third try with him. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it's getting back in touch with him and and setting myself for another attempt. Mm -hmm. And I think- big for me too, is realizing that it's okay. Like right now is okay. Like it, that, and if I felt bad around it, that that's temporary, right? Mm. Like, like you were talking about the need for, for loving oneself, but I think there also needs to be the space for allowing when you don't love yourself, right? That it, that it's okay mm. to be like, I don't like me right now. Mm. And realize that that dialogue might be present, mm. but it actually can be having a seat at the table, but it doesn't need to be hosting the dinner. Right. Mm. So like that, mm. that, that doubt can absolutely be present, but it doesn't need to be always get, getting the first word or the last word. 
Mm. Right? So, so that that dialogue is it changes. So the dialogue around, around me writing the book is positive with negative points sometimes, right? Mm. Um, and I think it's just me really bluntly sitting down and doing it. It's like bricklaying, right? Yeah. You got to lay the bricks, dude. You got yeah. to see it as a job, right? And if that's me needing to get some kind of financial carrot, like uh, an, an advance from a publisher that I have to give back, that's another mechanism, you know? Yeah. Is it literally having, you know, some kind of mechanism that forces me, but ultimately it has to be my choice, right? You know, it ultimately has to be come from within me to do it. So it's been, it's been well, kind of cool. Ronald and I both were, in, were, and I would say to some extent still are, in a very similar situation around our writing projects, which to both of us are really deeply meaningful. Like I took mine pretty far and actually ended up getting a book deal with a, a um, co-author at the time. And then I left the collaboration. So I got like pretty far and it was a very, you know, the journalistic uh, living it and then the journalistic aspect of it and then the pitching of it and the book proposal and then the agents and then like getting through all these stages you know was one of the most meaningful adventures of my life and now at the end of it all not the end but at the current stage I'm like left where it's I mean where you are it's in my hands you know and it's totally up to me and I know there's a good idea I, I you know I assume you're in a similar situation where you know the story is good, you know, and and you know there's value in it. Like a hundred percent, there's no doubt, which I think is, I think is a great place to be. And now it's like there's still these things that need to be done. And Ronald has a has an interesting situation too. He's an incredibly skilled writer, and it's really amazing to he writes like a fiction pieces that are like modern westerns, and they're captivating. And so we both have, we both believe in ourselves and we both have some work behind us and some skill and ability and dot, dot, dot. And then we were kind of like both also kind of frustrated. And there was a game changer for us. I just called a professional writer, a friend of mine, who's like a lunchbox writer, you know, like he just, he's just lived off of writing for decades and he just mm -hmm. does it. It's not a big romantic thing for him. It's just, it's just, he does it, you know, it's like eating, breathing, you know, shelter and writing right anyways um i called him and i was like listen I, we need help and uh what about a writing group and this was one year ago and he winged me ron and a third gentleman uh into a writing group and it changed our lives man because we had to be accountable and it, it brought out the best in us as writers and as creative people and as humans it ended also up being a really interesting place of connection humor and camaraderie and it shoehorned us out of being stuck in in these projects it was amazing just building community you know? well, and, I, and i think that you know having that accountability you know externally and then also internally right that you're like yeah. you know you make this pledge to write do this <laughs> word count or you make yeah. this pledge and but then you hold yourself accountable to yeah. it because you want the person that you're saying that you're going to do it to respect you still. Right. And, and that's important for me. And yeah. I think it's important for us. And then you know, they say all the time, like, you know, every writer, right. Is, is having difficulty writing, right. Like it's this, you know, loathsome, difficult task to get the words on the page. And there are so many that start on that path and never finish. And that there is a beauty in that yeah. as well. There is a beauty in identifying and starting and trying. Right. Totally. It was really cool to watch Ronald, particularly because like he didn't have an education in writing. My education is in journalism, part of it. And that's what I got my degree in. And then so I had more experience. And so he like really started getting better through the writing group. That was like one of his main educations. And um, so he was like rapidly getting better. And then his sort of he I, I was like, man, you need to go pitch at a writing conference. Like I've done it. It's exciting. You get to be right in front of an agent. You get to talk, you get to tell your thing, you get to connect. And so he said, fuck it, and challenged himself and booked a writing conference and went and pitched in front of like some legit, like big time agents. And mm -hmm. oh, it was like a huge part of his life, you know? And that was just through creating a writing. I don't know. It was great for us. Yeah, they all they all pulled out um, uh, cease and desist orders against me as soon as they <laughs> spoke with me. They're like, you may never, ever reach out to us again. <laughs> no, it was amazing. That was one of those moments. I think that for me, I had to, I had to know what it was like to get punched in the face. And, and I had to know what it's like to take a big fall or a big whipper or something like that. And no, I was going to survive. 
and you didn't take a big fall you had really good pitches <laughs> well um they were good pitches but i was still scared as shit i was scared man i was honestly more scared the day i was pitching than i was the morning i woke up in the in yosemite village to go or half dome village to go hike up half dome like it was it was it was that level for me i was i was nervous yeah you can be scared and not fall though i don't think you fell just to be yeah. to be like to yeah 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 discussion. no it was good you, they, you know yeah, i got the re- i got the response i wanted it was amazing it was amazing yeah. and we're you know we're heading to another one in february timmy what do you do um you're talking about this time for recharge. You gave us kind of about ba- a little bit of a boundary for yourself around our energy and, and you kind of just feeling like you need to recoup, which I think is outstanding. Um, what are your like off season or off climbing trip kind of ways that you do take care of yourself? Are you a meditator? I'm going to come back to your breath since you are breathing all the time. Um, are you, do you subscribe to any kind of breath work? Are you, or is this just movement is your practice and, and stillness is your practice? I think reading for me is is really a, a wonderful way to be still, like yeah. physically to be still, and uh, to still be exploring. You know, mm. I think a book is uh, a really wonderful way to travel. You know, it's yeah. like when you give gift somebody a book, you're giving them like an intellectual plane ticket, right? Yeah. So you could do this, take this journey, and, and have this experience. So I really love reading. I love sitting down. I love having a cup of tea or coffee, and and just sitting every morning and reading um i've been working on what's that i was just curious what you're reading or some books Uh, that have been influenced i mean i read you know a pretty wide array of things um right now i'm reading this book called flights that's the coffee maker letting me know that it's no longer going to be warm um (laughs) Last call, um, last call. Yeah, last call for <laughs> last coffee. Call. <laughs> and it's this Polish author. Um, she won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I want to say like maybe last year or two years ago. And her name, I want to say, I don't have the book in front of me. And her last name is difficult. It's like Turk or something. And I think her first name might be Olga even. And it's called Flights is the name of the book. If you guys are online looking at it right now. And then I'm reading a book called Apocalyptic Planet by a dear friend named Craig Childs, who's written like 15 books. And in this book, he does a deep dive into the mechanisms of climate change, Mm. uh, the mechanisms of of previous, you know, global earth catastrophes that have, you know, created species extinction, et cetera. And he, he just is this great writer who has incredible language and does the these travels meeting these scientists and explorers and whatnot um yeah but that's one way that i uh recharge the batteries and another way is through music hmm. playing music and you being drum, able to, drum? Is that what you're i do doing i play drums yeah i just played this saturday uh, a couple of days ago in a band? yeah mm-hmm. i'm in a band here in south that's lake awesome. tahoe that's and awesome. we got a chance to sit in, um, or rather this guy named Louis Schwadron sat in, uh, sat in with us and played. And he's a musician from Brooklyn and he has this really cool sound and he sings and plays keys and guitar. And he's a singer songwriter and just as is, is a professional musician, right? This is what he's doing for nice. his living. So he has this fluency and fluidity and just a really great presence. And you know, that kind of a conversation for me, music is this sort of original language, you know, mm-hmm. the mother's beat in, in utero. And, you know, you're having this conversation that's not around words, it's around playing a musical instrument. And then you have this harmony, right? It's like being in the pocket, you know, this suddenly when everything is aligning and, you know, the hair stands up on the back mm-hmm. of your neck and, you know, I'll often let out this cry of like satisfaction, like, yeah, <laughs> you know, we had, we had several of those um, this Saturday and then there's an audience, right? It was at a yeah. party at a yeah. friend's house and that really charges me. And I was coming back from a huge week and then big travels from Scotland. And, and then I was like exhausted actually, but I went, we did a sound check, set up my drums and we played for hours and it was so good. And people are like, <laughs> how do you do it? All this energy. Oh my God. And I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, you're right. But the music, man, the music. So I think being able to recognize that, you know, you can have 
like a physical exhaustion. Yeah. You could still have room in the sort of curiosity, creativity side, you know, yeah. and you, and you have these different batteries, right. That are, you know, totally. as, as one's going down, the other one's going up. And so uh, I find that, you know, I, I'm making these choices too, right? Like this is, no one's doing any of this to me. Like I'm not a victim of having too much to do or giving too much or, you know, being drawn down too much. I'm making all those choices. So I know that I can say no and chill, right? Yeah. Um, when I'm dead, mostly. Do you, <laughs> I was going to say, do you, uh, saying no is powerful, right? A friend of mine recently told me it's one of the most powerful things they learned in their life because they're kind of, their time is becoming more precious. And yeah, uh, how do you do with saying no? I imagine well, you have to do it a lot. I mean, yeah, there, like people say like, Rather, the point I want to make is um, I get invited to do a lot, right? Yeah. I get invited to go on trips. I get invited yeah. to, to talk to people. I get invited to, to assist and to help, right? And, and I love that invitation. I worked really hard to get invited. Mm. And, and when I say yes and I go, I work really hard to get invited back, right? Because mm. I, I want to be unforgettable. I, I want to have me being invited to dinner to the toast as opposed to being toasted at my death, right? Mm. So I want to be at the table. And I think as far as saying no, mm -hmm. N-O, if you add a K or a W on that, that's the word no in there as well, right? So no is in the word knowledge, right? And I think that to be able to say no is an act of self-preservation. Mm -hmm. And then it's also an act of, of, of respect for the person that you can't help because you don't have mm -hmm. the bandwidth or mm -hmm. you can't help because you don't have the skill mm -hmm. or what they need from you. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there's just you know the pragmatic side of, there's only so many hours. People say like, oh man, if I could only create an extra hour in the day. Well, you can by saying no to some of the things that are, that are not as necessary as what you want to create that extra hour for. That extra hour exists in the 24 frame. There isn't a 25th hour, right? That's fiction. That, that extra hour exists by you know, curating your life in a way that gives you the extra, extra time you need for whatever that is. Mm. Curating. That's such a good word. I love that word. <laughs> you know, Man, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah. So um, you were asking us earlier, like kind of what the theme of this podcast is and why we want you on. And, and one of the other things that is a, a big curiosity for Daniel and I is, is what's the next right step in our life? And that's a phrase that's kind of borrowed from the recovery community, uh, which I participated in before. I'm, I'm seven years uh, alcohol free. I'm not a teetotaler, but I, there's other things that happen in my life, but, um, alcohol is not one of those. Thank you for the, for the props, by the way, Tim, appreciate that. Um, in cutting for sign, I don't know if you've heard the phrase before, but it's an old archaic phrase, meaning, um, you know, what, what is the thing that you is giving you the clue in the pursuit of the thing that you are after? And, and for hunters, it's the bent blade of grass. It's the broken twig. It's the drop of blood. And, and my, that, that's a little bit of the culture I came from. My dad was really into that stuff. And to some extent I am. And, but for me, it's a metaphor of her life. Like, how do I decide on where's, where's the next turn I need to take? Do I need to put more pressure on this situation? Do I need to take some off? And I'm really curious for you, what that process is like for you. How do you understand what your next right step is? How do you feel that bliss in one moment that leads you over the ridge? or up the route or into a relationship? And how do you know when you sense that thing that is, that is telling your, uh, your intuition, nope, I'm, I'm gonna not go step over this threshold or I need to give myself some more bandwidth. What's that process like for you? Well, I think as far as like looking for the signs ahead, I think so much, you know, there's this thing called wayfinding, right? Which is yeah. where you are always connected to where you came from. Mm. so that you can not only find your way back, but you can project your way forward by understanding the direction of where you've been. So really, I think so much of what wisdom is about is remembering what happened, right? Mm. If, you do, if you can't recall it, then, then you can't use it for what's gonna be happening in the future, right? So I think mm. for me, as far as like, what's my next step? It's where am I currently? Where have I been most recently? what has worked and what hasn't, again, that's the essence of wisdom, right? You know, wisdom requires you to, to fail, to, to error, to, to be wrong so that you can have more data and, and point yourself, right? And course correct. Yeah. And I think 
for for my next move kind of a thing, I really am not very far in front projecting where that should be. It's usually pretty close. Mm -hmm. It's usually what's around that next bend. Yeah. And I think that that is, you know, what's around the next bend is a metaphor for being curious. And, and when you're curious, it means you're wondering about generally what's happening right now, what's in yeah. front of you, you know, what's happening, what's occurring. And I think if you have that curiosity, that generally that creates an action too, right? Well, I wonder what will happen if I, and then you find out because you, you perform the if, right? Yeah. And you make it and you make it actual. So you know, I think, go ahead, yeah. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's all right, yeah. It's a living conversation, yeah. Um, recently, I decided that, I, or not decided, but I was like taking an assessment of how much of, and I just put it into percentages, how much of my attention in the moment is, in, is on the future and how much of it is on the past, you know? And it was just an interesting reflection because I was like, whoa. Hmm. And then that changes during certain times, of course, but instead of it being like a constant state of maybe like 30 or 40 of my percent of my attention being in the future. And then what kind of attention is it? Is it a creative positive or is it fearful anxiety? And then by same thing on the past and then the ability to bring the percentage of what of my attention that's in the present, you know, and then maybe at a, for some amount of time, I need to put more attention into the past or more in the future, but just having a little bit of awareness for me around how much of a percentage of my attention and my energy is going into the present right now. And then the quality of that, and then the ability to move it around into the past, present, and future. It's been like a game changer for me because you only have this moment right now. Like this is the moment I'm going to die in, you know, and what's the quality of my attention going to be like on the moment of my death, you know, because it's going to be what it is right now. Mm -hmm unless I change that or develop. Well, Daniel, you know first I mean? of all, don't die right now because that would be <laughs> both for an awkward and memorable podcast. <laughs> It'd be the most popular podcast. Ronald yeah. is like, now wow. a solo podcast really? and it's very Daniel, popular. <laughs> Daniel was killing it and then he died. Then he died. <laughs> well, I think that that whole concept of like creating an algorithm or this calculus of like where we put are the percentages of what we're paying attention to and where we are yeah. past, present, future. Yeah, that's a good way to I think it. really that's like, you know, it's, alive it's it's yeah. moving right yeah. it's like it's yeah. changing it's not a static thing and like sure. it's an ongoing conversation it's an ongoing awareness and i think as you age you get used to having these conversations with yourself right and, and you mm -hmm. get uh, have a familiarity with what they may deliver you and even that understanding is changing meaning mm -hmm. that you know your ability to like oh yeah that's right could change and you go i used to think this now i think that so it's it's alive and it's moving and it's changing and so are we and I think the more that we can relax and be like I'm gonna give myself a get out of jail for free card for not living up to my expectations today mm -hmm. and, and I'm actually going to realize that I'm playing the comparison game right now to my mm -hmm. colleagues or those around me and forgive myself for that too yeah. and I'm going to realize that I was in the past a little too much and not in the present I'm going to forgive myself for that that concept of like creating it as a hot coal and wanting to have that hot coal be put down, right? Yeah. Because if we can be responsible for relieving the stress, relieving our pain, relieving our anxiety, we can create a more neutral and even positive story. Right? Where, where did that come from for you? When, when did you when did you hear forgive myself? And when did that make sense? And you and you then said, fuck, I got like, there's actually something, some shit I need to forgive myself for. I mean, my brother's paralysis. I have a brother, Sean, my older brother, who's paralyzed from the waist down. That's, that was my whole entree into adaptive mm. climbing. It was a very mm. personal experience yeah. where my brother became paralyzed. And that was like 25 years ago um, or so. And, but it was way after his paralysis that I finally realized I could never cure him. Mm. I could never make him whole again in the sense that I would be able to repair his spine. So it was in 2009. We had just climbed a peak in Alaska. Sean and I, his name's Sean, my brother mm -hmm. Sean. Hey, Sean, what's up, brother? And uh, um, we were climbing in Alaska. We've climbed, you know, El Capitan several times, and, and he's developed climbing techniques. In fact, they're being used right now. His visionary tactics are being uh, used on El Capitan by another sit climber, wow. somebody who is paralyzed. Um, 
So we were climbing together, 2009, Alaska, and Sean rolls into the hotel room. We're staying after the climb in Anchorage, getting ready to fly out the next day. And I go, he goes, what's up? I go, I'm just feeling a little bummed right now. I've got a little depression I'm dealing with, you know, but I realize it's fleeting. And, and I go, how are you doing? Mm. And he goes, I'm doing great. I'm doing totally fine. And I go, really cool. Tell me more. And he goes, I'm doing really good. And I believe that. I'm the one who has to believe that. Mm. You know, and I was like, oh, I've spent all these years trying to be his mind and trying mm. to change his mind. Mm. And then I realized that, wait, all I have to do is change my mind awesome. and A, accept his paralysis as permanent, B, accept that I could never cure it, and C, realize that I can momentarily alleviate how I feel about it through mm. climbing with him and providing mm. these experiences of with him as, as a climber, he became a climber after his paralysis. Yeah. So I had this huge shift. I was like, oh, duh, all this time I've been like trying to do the impossible when the possible, which was changing the way I thought about it. And it, it was a huge epiphany for me that I have absolutely used all the time moving mm -hmm. forward that I get to create the story. Mm -hmm. I get to be the judge, the jury, and the excuser, not the executioner. Right? I can excuse myself. I can excuse it. I can recognize it and put the hot coal down and not try and cradle it or try and smother it. Right? I could just let it be. Yeah. And Sean was like, dude, I'm, I'm great. My paralysis is who I am. Like, huh. this is, I'm a patient, accepting individual. And I recognize this is who I am forever. And I was like, thank you. Oh. I mean, let, me, let me ask you this, man. Uh, I think what a problem or a stumbling block that a lot of people might have and that I had in, in my life with what you just said, with, with doing what you just said and embodying it and listening to it is that a lot of that stuff will be mental and they'll get that down and they'll get the mental aspect. You can do the reminders and they can say the things, but it's not sinking in on an emotional level or maybe not very deep into emotional level. Can you speak a little bit to how you get to an emotional subconscious inner change that's not just on the surface with mental i i think what you do is is by practicing it right like the more that you can have small successes where you actually try it apply it and have a little relief and you're like oh i just felt that like that actually worked and then you go back to it right? So conditioning is what you do for your physical body mm. when you're training. So conditioning is what you have to do for your intellectual or emotional bodies or states by, by practicing it, right? So, and it sounds know, like also experiment, like what you, the way you just said it, it sounded like you're also kind of being, you'd be curious about it, experiment, try something new each time. Is that kind of what you're saying too? Yeah, I think that again, it's a living document. Like this conversation, oh. we're going to interrupt each other. We're going to talk and not finish things. You know, it's it's imperfect, right? And I think that's a huge thing for us is that we're both impermanent and imperfect. For me personally, mm. I will yeah. not be here for very long. And yep. while I'm here, I will be fucking up a lot, right? And so it's important for me to realize that if it's a short mm. journey and I'm going to make mistakes, forgive myself for them. And mm. right away, try and do better. Right? Yeah. Try, try to, and do better. Doesn't mean be better. That sounds so harsh, but if you could try and be better, right? It gives you leeway for acknowledging that you have to try and that you may not. Sorry, me. That you may try and you may fa fail. Sorry, me. And that you may try and you will be succeed. Well done, me. Again, mm -hmm. that this dialogue doesn't always have to point at and identify the negative. It can identify the positive, it can identify the neutral, that there's a, that, that if we dilate, right? If we open up a little bit and just see it for what it is, that it's all the things at the same time. Now that sounds like this really, you know, overwhelming cacophony of choice. So we can have that. So they could be there in your periphery, but you're still deliberately identifying the thing you're working on, right? Again, it's like this table where there are so many chairs and they are all guests at your table. Mm -hmm. At your dinner, you're the host. You create the menu, you create the toast. You may have not created the invitee list because maybe you wouldn't invite grief or mm. doubt or anxiety mm. or sadness, but they're still at your table. Mm. So it's up to you how much voice you want to allow them to have. So have a seat, nice. grief. 
You get to have a word at the table. You, you will be fed at the table, but you are not the principal guest. You are not the host. And I think for us to realize that at this feast called life, there are many chairs at your table and you actually don't get to choose who sits, but you can choose how much bandwidth they take, yeah. how much oxygen they take in your room called life. Who speaks? Holy shit. Timmy, that's um, that's a worth the price of admission right there, man. Now, I'm, I'm quite moved by everything you're saying. And, and one of the things that I, I'm noticing this in you is in, I think that ability you just described so well like i'm i'm really so impressed with what you just um presented to daniel and i has given you a really comfortable relationship with the word failure you mentioned it before i asked it about you about it a little bit and and you even just saying the word i think right now we're in a culture where we say things like it's not a failure unless you quit or or we give all these other kind of um uh um, qualifiers to that word. And you don't, you don't, you just have added the word data to it. You have a very comfortable relationship. It seems like, what the hell? Why, why, how, where'd that come from? What do you mean by failure? Um, and, and like, I, I think we're so, fr- many of us don't start because we're afraid of failure. Many of us will, will have that story played out in a, in a piece of fiction in our mind about our dreams and hopes and our desires and who we want to be because of that relationship with failure. And it's really obvious you have a very different kind of relationship. So unpack that a little bit for me. Well, I think if I were to look at my life conventionally, I would be considered a failure, right? Because Mm -hmm. I I really don't have many objects in my life. Like I, I want my life not to be something I show for it, but something I feel for it. Mm. And by that, I mean, it's about human relationships. It's about creating meaningful connection. It's about shared purpose. And those aren't tangible, really. Mm. Those are the way you treat people. Those are the way that you identify and acknowledge people. Those are the ways that you're grateful and ask for permission around people. It's all around relationship. And that is time, right? Once again, that is time the time you place into that, right? And that again is lifetime. And that again, truly does go back to breathing, the most simple thing, right? So I feel for me personally, I identified early on, I became a climber when I was 19. And I became a deep dirt bag by the time I was 21. I was living in a cave in Joshua Tree National Monument at the time in Southern California. And I was living on a hundred bucks a month, man. And that will be the easiest and freest, truest, most beautiful way that I will have ever been alive mm-hmm. was when not only had I met all of these people and not one of them was like anyone I'd ever met before, but they were all like me, mm-hmm. right? I identified mm-hmm. this tribe, right? And I identified this way to be, and it was like so amazing. So for the last 30 years, I've been living with those tenants. I've been living mm-hmm. with those ethos, right? It's about how you're treated right? You know, the golden rule, treat others as you want to be treated, yeah. not he who has the gold makes the rules. Fuck that one, right? So for me, conventionally, if I were to define my life with bank account, with possessions, with degrees, with external benchmarks of success, I actually have none of them, right? Mm-hmm. I'm broke. I have really no possessions. I, I have, I, I dropped out of college, you know, in 13th grade, I called it because the conventional school system didn't work for me. Yeah. So I could call myself a failure. If I played that game, that's a mm. dangerous lose game, right? The yeah. sum is a loss for me, right? Yeah. Zero sum game. So because of that, I realized that I could have a fluency and a fluidity with mm. defining my life, right? Mm. With with being in charge of who gets to say whether I'm good or bad or whether I'm successful or not. And I actually own that. But that doesn't mean that I don't look to you guys for affirmation, that I'm not on Instagram looking for likes. Like that would be bullshit if I said that, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't see counsel and mentorship when I'm ailing and failing Mm -hmm. and sad Mm -hmm. and all of that. And all is to simply say that I learned when I decided to step out of the rat race, Mm -hmm. right? that I didn't stop being a rat. I'm still a rat, right? But I'm not in that race anymore. Mm. 
not identifying that regimen, that finish line, that course as where I participate in my breathing and my good work, mm -hmm. right? So that doesn't insulate me from still feeling like, you know, I, why didn't I play that other game, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you still have the feelings, right? I think this is the biggest takeaway is you still have all the bullshit. You just don't make the bullshit your destination. You mm -hmm. make it a data point, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. when you identify the bullshit and you let it have, it becomes this dilemma that you can't solve. So now it's in front of you, right? Mm -hmm. So if you let it be in front of you, then you're blinded. So you have to go around it, right? So this all sounds like a bunch of new age gobbledygook, but at the end of the day, I get to define who I am. Yeah. That's why when we started this conversation, my new friend, Lore Sabrin, who yeah. just became a Patagonia athlete, um, they are non-binary. Yeah. And, you, and, and I use they, them when talking about Lore. That's yeah. hard for me. Yeah. I'm 52. I'm not used to that. So what I identify it as, as not only difficult, but as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity yeah. to lean in, as an opportunity to become better, because I'm going to realize that it's better and that lore needs that for me. And I want to provide that, right? Yeah. So I could identify it as, fuck that. I'm not doing yeah. that. That's bullshit. Where do they get off troubling me? Instead, I go, I love cruxes. I love difficult. I love elective challenge. And I love lore. So I'm going to work with them on treating them with the respect and, and all of that, right? Like that's just a modern day, just this last Friday interpretation of you get to set how you see the world. Mm. And I think that these days, which is like this kind of funny thing, these days, the story has remained the same, right? Nothing has changed on the story. The frequency and the pitch is changing. And the fact that we really, our destination seems so much around negativity and division, really. And those have never been my destinations. Yeah. They, are, they are unity, right? They are togetherness. They are, and a great book, Daniel, you mentioned earlier, a book that I did read that I love reading um, is this book called by Robin Wall Kimmerer called Braiding Sweetgrass. It is one of the best books I've read in years. Mm. And in it, she talks about gratitude, acknowledgement and permission. That's how you build a relationship, right? That's how you sustain a relationship. We may have met via this podcast by accident in a way, but it is through purpose and on purpose that we stay together, right? Mm -hmm. And that's mean, a decision. What do you mean by permission in that? Or what do you think she means by permission in that? That book's been recommended to me three times in the last month. Dude, it's so good. It, she killed it. Every chapter oh. stands alone as, as, a, as, a, as a parable, as, as sort of mm -hmm. a truth you know, around human nature, wow. right? Um, and, and by permission, she says, I'm going to take your life animal and eat you. I'm going to collect you, plant and sustain myself via you. Wow. Or for, for you, Daniel, you got in touch with me and said, Timmy, we want your ideas, your insight, your perspective, your wisdom, perhaps. And, and in it, you're asking me for, for, for permission because then you told me it's important for me to find these things, to share them, for my own well-being and hopefully for the well-being of your listener, right? So there is a calculus there. I ask for permission because I need this thing in return because I'm going to do this thing with it. And, and that is, I believe, healthy because you don't just take and keep it selfishly. You ask, may I have it for myself because I want to do this thing that's meaningful with it, sustain my family with the flesh of the deer you know, sustain my community with the flesh of this idea, right? So I think that's what Robin Wall Kimmerer means by permission. And in order to, to ask for permission, you have to say, hi, I'm Timmy, you know? So you have to identify yourself yeah. and you have to be a human, right? Like, for example, a quick story, climbing on El Capitan, you know, we talked about speed climbing. So we're speed climbing and there's somebody above you and it's a partner and, or rather it's, it's a, you know, two climbing partners and you're going to pass them this party. And I'll always be like, Hey, what's going on guys? You know, what's your name? Hey, Mike, it's Timmy. And, you know, I identify myself right away. And then my needs, can we please pass you be, because we're doing this speed record? I could just go say nothing, pass them, be an asshole about it and then create ill will, right? Mm -hmm. And create ill feelings and create dis-ease. So I think, again, it's a choice to be like, 
you know, ask acknowledgement. You're mm. human. I'm a human, mm. you know, permission. Hey, can I pass? And gratitude. Thank you so much. And mm. that is a recipe for bringing people together. That is yeah. a recipe for creating love, which is the one word that, that defines why are we here? Mm. What is it all about? What mm. is the reason for the season? It is love. Mm. Man, I'm, I'm so inspired. I'm sitting here thinking like, what, what a badass life that I've been able to lead to um, be inspired by you for more than 20 years to have my life, <laughs> um, my, <clears throat> my adopted son has a better dad. My 10 year old daughter has a better dad. My wife uh, has a better husband. More importantly, I have a person that I look at in the mirror who I respect and um, unhook from a lot of the guilt I had about my life and the failures that I felt like I had. And some of that is in part because um, of the light that you have been um, letting shine for the majority of your career, for all of your career. And, and I'm sitting here going like, what what a fucking amazing gift that I got to like zoom into your, into your um, updraft for a moment, some, in some way, inspirationally, right? And have my own adventure because of it. And then I get to come back and get in that updraft again right now and share your wisdom and experience with who knows who. And they're going to go, God damn it, I can't put this thing off in my life anymore. I can't put this joy off in my life anymore. I can't put this project off anymore. I can't can't keep holding myself to this uh, fear, guilt, and shame I've got in my life because I, I don't owe it to myself anymore. So I'm, I'm like electric, Timmy, uh, with, with the wonder of all the, how all the shit works. And I couldn't agree with you more about love is our purpose. Um, you know, my um, 2019 was one of the hardest fucking years of my life. And, um, and getting to climb half dome was one of the most healing things of my life. And then getting to be in relation, I've known Daniel for 10 years, we've, we've done some life together, but we didn't really get close to the end of 2020. And having his love as a brother in my life has been one of the most healing things. And just us having these conversations with all kinds of different people, like you, we, have a, we have a broad, broad spread of badass folks who've been on here. And, and this is just like, you know, the craziest fucking gift, I can't even, can't, I can't yeah. believe it. It's amazing. Timmy, the short answer to your original question of why we, um, is that me? That's you, dude. No, it's not. Oh, haha. Uh -huh. Oh, it is. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> the short answer of, uh, um, of why we wanted you on here is because you're one of Ron's heroes. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. And, and I think that um, I really do appreciate that, actually, because that is good affirmation. Right, which we seek in this world. And, and it's affirmation that does charge my batteries, right? Mm. And it's perhaps not why I'm doing it, yeah. but it does let me know it's working what I'm doing, right? So thank you. And I think for me, so much of it is, how can I give those little pieces away, right? How can I keep powering that through accidental, which would be, I, I produce a film or I, I do this podcast and that's by accident. Somebody may stumble upon that, but then by purposeful mentorship and counsel. So how can I keep paying it forward? How can I keep sharing that bliss and that joy and that peace and that love on purpose, right? So I do that through being involved on the board of directors of the Yosemite Climbing Association. And, and our goal is to preserve the deep history and knowledge of Yosemite's climbing and share it with the world. And we are doing that through our new museum mm -hmm. and, all, and all the other volunteer opportunities that I'm involved in through cureblindness.org, through paradoxsports.org. And yeah, I, I give away a lot of my time because if time is money, I'm giving away a lot of money too, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that is just a fungible term, right? Money, time, love, those are all the same thing, especially if you're getting to define them, which yeah. you are, listener, you are getting <laughs> to define that. Really, like, yeah. it's true, it's true, you get to call yeah. it. That's why Laura's thing around non-binary gender is so hard for people because they're like, no, you don't get to pick that. Actually, you do. Yeah. 
You say yeah. you don't, well, that's your story and your truth, but don't project that and push that and be brutal upon somebody else who's looking for relief and understanding and yeah. peace. And so I think all of that to simply say, you get to set the arc of your life. You get to make the choices that guide you using the data that is around you. That's why when you look at the world through that tiny little hole in that hotel door, not only is it so small and so distorted, you're cutting out every, all the other information. Mm. So really the best thing is just to open your mind, open your ears, you know, open your mouth when necessary, definitely open your heart. Mm. And, and as a result, open your life to a lot more goodness. Yeah, I am so into that. Hey, we'll let you go in just a second here. One thing I wanted to ask you about is Joy Merchant. Tell me a little bit more about that, how people can find it, what, what you do. That sounds fascinating. I'm, my gears are turning already thinking about how I could step into that, hire you in some way or, or refer yeah, you so, in some way. What's going well, on with that? What, what Joy Merchants basically is, is a dear friend of mine, Sarah Leone and I, when we both worked at Paradox Sports together, I was the... Um, the CEO, the executive director rather, and, and she was operations. So we stepped away from that. I ran that for three years and I mm -hmm. founded it and then basically turned it into a business, which it remains today. Uh, we created a curriculum around adaptive climbing where we mm -hmm. train people and, you know, educate and, and do all of this, right? And then all, of course, provide all these experiences through our, you know, major adventures and uh, journeys and explorations that we go on. So when we pieced out from that, um, we were working together. She's amazing. I love you, Sarah Leone. <laughs> and we started a business where we would basically work with teams, teams from corporations. So mm -hmm. they could be, for example, um, the Reno store um, for Patagonia. I'm going to work with Aaron and his team on a, a one day, right? Like just a, a single retreat for a day. Um, we work with this amazing corporation, Equinix. They do data storage worldwide. But these companies, these brands, these cultures are made of people, right? So the people need to interact. The people need to have new experiences. The people need to uh, gel together, right? And, and then also work on themselves. And as I know, the wilderness and nature is a great place for that, like Nature RX, right? Yeah. So we do these uh, multi-day retreats where they're pretty chill, car camping, and people meaning like we drive to the site and you walk a tiny yeah. bit and then they yeah. set up their tent and then they're camping for their first time ever in their life. And you're seated around a fire that night after doing a six mile hike through an amazing wilderness. And you deliberately have conversations that get to the heart of it. Like, like we're trying to do today. Right. right. And what happens as a result of this is that you're in a new environment. So all normalcy is taken away. So you feel more exposed, more vulnerable. Uh, and, and as a result, it's like an emery board being taken to a mm. callus, mm. right? You wear away that dead skin and you feel life a little more. You're aware of the data points a little more. And hopefully you can navigate and make some, make some changes in your life for, to navigate towards a better health and a better balance in your work, in your community, in your relationships, your family, et cetera. And they're just fun. Like they're yeah. amazingly fun. And whenever you could be out amongst the trees and birds and insects and water and the sky and the elements, it's better. It's a good one, man. I'm stoked about that. Thanks for sharing that, man. And thank yeah. you for being here today, Tammy. I hope we didn't gush too hard. <laughs> no, it was, uh, it was great. Thanks very okay. much for, for having me on the program, guys. I appreciate yeah. the opportunity to get to know you better. Well, I really you, appreciate too, you, you uh, going visual with us. Th I hope that wasn't too much of an ask. Thank you. No, not at all. No, not at all. I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh God, I really don't want to be on camera, but uh. <laughs> Dude, but, your, but your beautiful head of hair at 52 years old is, is aspiring. I love it. I love it. <laughs> right on dudes. Yeah. Hey, nice all right. Thanks you. dude. Appreciate it. All right. Have Thanks, a great sir. day. Yeah. Later. Take care, Tim. Here we are, field dressing, <laughs> cutting for sign episode 30 something. <laughs> 34, I think, right? 35. 35. 35. Timmy O'Neill, man. I was scared. I was nervous. I think you could tell. You get nervous, man. Why do you get funny? nervous? You have no reason to be. I know. I know. I don't. I know. It's just my own insecurity. I mean, what I, you know, God damn, he was, he was, he blew me away. He really did because I, I, 
I thought I knew he was a cool guy. I, look, I didn't have him on a pedestal. I wasn't like I didn't think he was I Jesus or God or anything like that. But um, uh, you have Jesus on a pedestal. I think I Thank do. God. I think Thank I do God. have Jesus on the pedestal. I don't um, think Jesus would want you want to be on a pedestal. Would he? That's a good question, and Maybe probably not. Probably not. Actually, yeah. Um, side note, side well, note. Jesus talk. I think we're about I to don't get know. derailed real fast here. Hold Ted, on a second. <laughs> come back. Let's come back. That'll be its own episode on Christianity. Hey, I'm not making a statement. Maybe Jesus is on the pedestal. I don't know. Yeah. I just was curious. <laughs> um, uh, him, him can, giving us those like deep downloads about like who's at the table when he was describing grief and sadness and failure and those are real ex- and, and I want to say even just within the climbing world he's experienced grief probably like mm. few I know oh, have. oh that's right and a bunch of people die friends yeah 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 like serious that's tragic right. stuff that's right uh and the climbing world is just that way man like you there's an edge there is an edge and on the other side of that edge is is yeah. serious consequences yeah and and so in a way like he's also one of those guys who have like threaded that needle really well for himself huh. but um but his redefining of failure, redefining of, of life on his terms, which is this continual thing, man, men need to hear that. People need to hear that. And I think to our, you know, my target audience, if you will, I don't know if that's right to say, but uh, is, is men who really understand that life cannot continue to be the same way. And Timmy is, is one of those guys that like that hit him really early in life at 19 years old being, you know, cave dweller in, in, in Joshua Tree and and the funny thing is, I know some of the people he connected with um, in Joshua Tree, and 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 it's like it like warms my heart to know that they like mentored him back then. And and those guys are in their sixties now, right? And um, and they're good folks, like really good people who have not had normal lives. And and he is showing us like life. What did he say? He said, "I'm going to fuck it up," but it is you know he looked at the camera. And he was kind of giving us the call, right? Like that was like the call, the hero's journey call right there. He gave it to us. Like life can be different than you think it can be. I'm paraphrasing what he said. Some to that effect. I can't remember what he said, but it was life changing. <laughs> <laughs> like it will echo in my mind. I will never forget the way he said <laughs> that thing. That is something to the effect of, <laughs> of, of be better, be life, be life. Do good life. Be better. Yeah, the wise words words of Timmy O'Neill. Do good life, as spoken by Ron Cecil. Ten minutes later. <laughs> do good life. <laughs> What's your purpose in life? Do good. <laughs> do good. I got that from Timmy O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> do good I life. You, man. I get you. <laughs> yeah. What was that like for you? Uh, one, watching me try not to gush, and two, um, just to your own experience in that. Um. I think that you and I are working out how to connect with people and Mm. it's fun to rep that out with you. Well, interesting. Yeah, it is. I thought I, I, like I said before, I am on my third day of Adderall and I've had (laughs) uh, 16 ounces of coffee. You might want to double your dose. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) And so we were, we thought we'd do a great job. Yeah. 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 But But, I think our energy was high before he got on. And then as he came on, he like told us to like kind of dial it down. That which I think good. was is so good. It was super good. I think like yeah. people need to be able to say that shit. Like, hey, I'm I am feeling a certain way and I need this kind of energy in the house. That was, and that I love was it. It's just you and me prepping to meet an energy of a person whose whole shtick is that energy. Like we were totally. doing a good job. Well like, said. Well by said. Being very present and yeah. up, you know. And, yeah. And then he arrived in a different um, emotional state and communicated that very quickly and in very kindly and we matched and I yeah. thought I had no problem with that I'm just when I say you and I are learning how to connect with people I think that you know when when a person asks what is this podcast about for example I, I have to be honest I still have to stagger through that um, yeah because it's been changing I think I do too yeah yeah and I know I just know we have something special and it's and the guests and the listeners and us are all benefiting from it we get constant feedback about that yeah and so i know that articulating around it because it's changing and kind of changing very consistently we'll probably get better about it but i'm more of a process oriented person regarding most things and i'm totally fine with having moments that don't work and 
having guests, an uh, awkward moment with a guest, or even whole episodes that might have been like, oh, that didn't, we've had that happen a couple times where we just decided yeah. not to air it, you know? Yeah. So I embrace it. I love it. And I thought that um, a lot of really good stuff happened there. And I'm, I'm not as like directly inspired by him because I'm not into climbing. Yeah. Um, but I really am into his ability to communicate his emotions. Yeah. And and I had something about you I really respect and to feel those emotions in front of other people and also not to like call too much attention to those emotions when they're happening, like making it seem like it's some rare thing that's, you know, it's like, no, it's normalizing. It's human. Guys can cry in front of guys. It's not a yeah. big deal. Yeah. People can cry, cry in front of people. People can get mad in front of people and you don't have to be hurtful. You know what I mean? All that stuff. Yeah. I think some yeah. of that stuff, you know, happened during this the conversation. I was really glad that it did. Mm. You're talking about me cracking crying a little bit i thought it was great i just <laughs> love it and i'm glad you didn't put too fine of a point on it happening yeah. you know yeah. it's just like people can hear it they know sure. it's happening and it, it can just live and be a thing you know and the fact that you can do that in front of one of your heroes is a huge thing that respect that oh man thanks I, it, it uh i had no choice to be honest <laughs> it's gonna well, come out probably could have shut it down though yeah i could have just not said anything well, no, I'm serious yeah. though. Like he was talking about, it. we decide to some extent who talks at our inner table. Yeah. You know? And when I say who talks, like a lot of that I, means yeah. my emotions. You know? You're right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, man. Well, um, I owe you a big, I think, thanks because I gave you a big list of people to reach out to for this podcast. And some of those were Hail Marys. And honestly, he was a Hail Mary man. Like, um, so it meant a lot when he was saying, not only do I want to be uh, asked to come, I want to be asked to come back. And, um, and, and I think that is a testament to his, um, his desire to be influential in a positive way. And, but more so, man, like you, you know, I guess you just didn't have any baggage around like asking uh, popular people or anything like that you know, to be on our podcast. And, and so just, I want to say, thanks, man. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. And thanks for making this happen. And, and, uh, it wouldn't have happened without you. I appreciate that. Awesome. I appreciate that. I, I do really enjoy reaching out to the humanity and people, the human, the person to person, you know, where I don't really care about the fame of someone because I know a lot of famous people can be jerks and also a lot of famous people cannot have a lot to them, you yeah. know, that we wouldn't, honestly, we would not be interested in you know, and so we're looking for people who, and, and there's a lot of people who have a lot to them who aren't famous, you know, and yeah. I think we do a really good job of choosing people who have what we're looking for, not regardless of whether or not they're famous, to be honest, like, if you have a bunch of people who can, who listen to you, I would like to have you on to hear, so more people would yeah. hear what we want to, what we believe in, you know, right, it's, not yeah. big, it's not really wrong with that, you know, yeah. But also you and I have turned our attention to people who nobody knows about them because they're singular, you know, and they're interesting yeah. and they have yeah. a lot that should be shared through. That's our right. Life yeah, platform. totally. Totally. You know, so yeah. He, 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 what, he's the one to thank because he not only did he say yes and take his time, but out of nowhere, he just followed up after like four months. That's amazing. Cold Timmy, thank you. Basically. Shit, dude, man. You, you changed it. Thank you. What, what a cool yeah. value. He told me as soon as he picked up, I picked up the phone. He was like, I have a value around not letting phone calls, you know, mm. just totally go away. And yeah. he, four months later, he kept the voicemail and made the call. Well, you know, what's rad is, is both you guys have a, have a, um, uh, a value around voice messages and, <laughs> cool. and I give Thanks you a hard that. time. I give you no, a hard time, you not that. because I don't like listening to him, but because my phone, you know, it's like te the technology that supports it is, can be a pain in the ass. And I get frustrated with that, but, I always right. treasure the long voice me memos and messages you send me and don't stop doing them. <laughs> and, uh, uh, okay. I have a vow, vow though to you. I have a wait, 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 wait. I'm not done. I'm not done. Let oh, me finish. Let me finish. Who cares what you have to say? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I think is, has helped me develop deeper and better relationships. That is an off a spin off of that thing that you gave me, which is these, insanely long voice messages that i can never say <laughs> like five <laughs> minutes man that's not insanely long i had a girlfriend who used to send me 20 minute ones multiple oh like gosh. her thumb got tired at 20 minutes and so she had to stop it and then start another one so uh, you know pump the brakes on the that, insanely long my friend. uh that sounds abusive <laughs> also <laughs> tw also 20 minute voicemail coming your way <laughs>
Well, what here? Okay, asshole. Listen, the the what what it's given me is the bravery to pick up the phone and call people, like okay. people that I love and respect and okay. and am curious about. And it happened yesterday. I was like, I got a text message from somebody. Someone's going on in their life. It probably could have been handled just through text forever, right? Like, like it yeah. could have just been done. And instead, I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna pick up the phone, call them. And I did that several times this last week. And it has always been a fantastic connection, like a great way to. Turns out, talking to people is good for relationships and good for the soul. People, should, people need to get on this thing. This thing called talking. Agreed. I love it. That's awesome. That's why I love the iPhone voice memos or voice memos in general, you know, Yeah. But which is what we're talking about. We're not talking about voicemail. We're talking about voice memos, you know, through text. And well, but did you leave them also. a voicemail? I did. Nice. I How called him that because yeah. he, he, for some reason, he gave us his contact instead of just keeping it to Insta. He was like, here's yeah. my phone number. Gotcha. Here's my email. And so I emailed and then I was like, fuck it. Yeah. voice is special you know because the they can the hear best. your yeah, yeah they hear your voice they hear your sincerity if, if you have some ron you're not very sincere so people are not going to hear the sincerity in you but for me <laughs> the, red, the, the red flags are up immediately as soon as i start talking they're like you know what something <laughs> he's angling for something i need to walk, take care of my wallet here i love you man i will not send you voice memos beyond three minutes that should no, be my rule you, hold on you're gonna, you're it should be my rule because i feel like the voicemail world actual phone voicemails they cut you off at three minutes and i think that that's like a universe that's a universal language i'm gonna keep them to under three minutes it's already long it's already long you leave 20 second ones i love that you do that Oh, oh, okay. You like the 20 second one? I do, because I don't care what you have to say. So it just gets, it <laughs> saves me time. <laughs> you could just but, say you listen. You're like, yeah, I heard it. I heard it. You told me say. you told me you wanted me to give you more shit on this on the show. And I'm flexing those muscles right now. I hope it's okay. Don't get mad at me later. <laughs> I'm definitely gonna cry later. <laughs> I love you. For know. sure, for sure. Um, well, Daniel, you we did it again. It happened. And um you know, fucking awesome. What a great episode. Thank you, Timmy O'Neill, for, for coming to talk to a couple dorks. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> a couple of times I was like, I did not say that clearly at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he whatever. thinks I'm a moron. Perfect. And he's kind of right. Like there's definitely a moron sitting at my table inside my inner world. There's, he, there's a spot like firmly planted Oh. Not a smart person, like really not the best. <laughs> Dude, I, I've been studying. I'm going to get a certification in, in this study of psychology called internal family systems. Yeah. And, and the idea is you essentially create relationships with all those different parts of you. Awesome. And, and as I've been going through this and identifying all the parts of me, like there's a lot of juvenile uh, <laughs> dudes there yeah. who like need to grow the fuck up and like, or, mature or, and be loved and be held and yeah. like all this stuff right <laughs> or also like hey man it's your time to like headbang and and like yes hardy hard and let's do it two nights ago i went to a i've been dancing on saturday nights a different yeah. type of dance not partner dance i go to a pub and they have rock they have electronic music and they have punk nice and i didn't know if i had it in me because i wasn't sure i would connect with the music yeah but it's some of the funnest dancing I've ever done. And on Saturday night, I was no joke, literally mosh pitting. Oh, like, and there was a, this bunch of women around and they were all also mosh pitting. And there was a couple of moshing. Guys. It was like mosh pit. Thank you. Yeah. I'm a fucking dork. No kidding. <laughs> they were, we were moshing. And yeah. they would like get little running starts and it was so fucking fun. Man. Yeah. It was one of the awesome. funnest things I've ever done. So my wife and I had like a, a three day date this last weekend and it was so super fun. And, oh. um, and one of the things that we were kind of doing was like talking about our fantasies with each other. And I mean like sexual fantasies with one another. And it was a fun cool. conversation. And then I was like, Hey, I've got another fantasy I want to tell you about. And she's like, okay, let's hear this, you know, you know, fucking <laughs> okay, right. whatever, three Rado, minutes, please. like trapezes or whatever <laughs> it needs to happen here. <laughs> No, but here's the fantasy. And I and 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 I have this fantasy of like she and I being in uh, a European city. I feel like it's somewhere in Germany and like going to a for real European rave and just yeah. dancing all night long. Hell yeah. Like 
Yes. It's been a long time since I've been that been MDMA. <laughs> yeah, a little bit sure. Of, a little bit of drugs. Yes. And the right. Oh, I completely agree. My neighbor who lives right here, he's yeah. like an additional unit on the same property. He's in that world. He and his girlfriend, and they've been telling me about it. And I was like, no, it's not my thing. And now I'm like, that's totally my thing. That's probably <laughs> everybody's thing because everyone's got a little psychopath sitting at their inner table who yeah. needs to fucking live. <laughs> yeah, dude, I, I'm into it. Like, I'm I'm already like, okay, when when do I need to go to Berlin or or Munich or whatever? Totally, totally, totally. I want to get into it, man. I totally want to get into it. Okay, well, we will stop talking now. Thank you, Daniel. You're amazing. I'm gonna hug you over there in Chico on the yeah. beautiful sunny day from Portland, where it's Portland weather. Awesome. Uh, dude, this you is did awesome. push record today, right? Oh, we're gonna have to redo this. <laughs> we're gonna definitely have to redo this. <laughs> Dude, we've been on for two and a half hours. Amazing. I know. It's been a while. Awesome. All right, right, dude. Love you, dude. Talk to you later.